a line in the sand. I want to be standing by your side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come. Let it live in me. This is my prayer. This is my plea. Let, Let the, the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. Hallelujah. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to my King. Come on, sing that verse again. Now, Father, I can see that you are drawing a line in the sand. I want to be standing by your side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come. Let it live in me. This is my prayer. This is my plea. Let the worshipers rise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. He is worthy. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to my King. Thank you, Lord. Father, I can hear it growing louder. The song of your redeemed as the saints of every nation are awakening to sing. From our hearts there comes an anthem. Oh, hear the heavens ring. This is our song, a song to our King. Let the worshipers rise. You worthy, Lord. Let the sons and the daughters sing. Thank you, Lord. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to my King. Thank you, Jesus. Let the worshipers rise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. Thank you, Jesus. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to my King. Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the King of kings. Yes, you were. Yes, you were. And now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out. We join them as we sing glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Forever we sing glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Creator God, you gave me breath so I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let your whole life be a blazing offering, a life that shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, glory to God. Forever we sing glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. Oh, take my life and let it be 
All for you and for your glory. Take my life, let it be yours. Oh, take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life, let it be yours. As we sing glory to God. Glory to God, glory to God forever. We sing glory to God, glory to God, glory to God forever. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing, great are you, Lord. Come on, just lift your voices and declare that tonight. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord. Give life, you are love, you gain light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great are you, Lord, and all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing, great are you, Lord. Oh, we praise his name. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing, great are you. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. Great. 
great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you tonight in Jesus' name for your goodness. We thank you, God, as we just give you all the glory and honor. Lord, that you would just open up heaven in this place tonight. Lord, that you would rest on your word in Jesus' name. And the church declared, amen and amen. Well, greet those who are here tonight, and welcome to all of you online. Am I on the mic? Am I on my headset on now? That's good. Well, you're sitting close. You can hear me for sure. Amen. There we go. Now we can turn me down a little bit. So, I know. Praise the Lord. Well, we apologize. I guess there was no guitar volume on the, uh, on the live feed tonight, but apparently maybe had a, a battery that's dead on the guitar, so we'll see what happens. But I will say this, that if you're watching online tonight, we need you to check in and tell us that you're joining us online so we know you're not playing hooky uh, from church tonight, amen? So we knew the weather's supposed to get bad, but we'll know that you didn't go to church at all if you don't put, hey, and I'm here tonight on the live feed so that we know that you're here. You know, and you can't tell me there's three inches of snow in your living room. You can make it to your computer to tell us that you're here. Amen. So we're going to start tonight. I want to re. This is like a revisit or a rehash or a refresh of our. You know, the church has a mission and we have a purpose, but we also have a strategy. Our mission and our purpose kind of lay the foundation for what we do, but the strategy is how we execute what God has laid on our hearts to do. And we have been talking a lot about moving from a mission or an, an attractional model of church to a missional model, where we're not, it's not about attracting unbelievers to the church to see them saved, but it's empowering the believers to go into the world and to win the lost. That's the missional model. And so in order to do that, we had to, we did this a couple of years ago. I was looking back, it was 2019 when I began to cast the vision for this. And, and so the mission of the church, and we're just going to start there tonight talking about the mission of the church. Uh, it, Dayspring Community Church exists to seek and save the lost. And that is based out of Luke 19.10. If you want to follow along, of course, this is a passage of scripture we're all familiar with. Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. How many know that should be the mission of the church? If we, are, if we have a different mission other than seek and save the lost, then we are not the body of Christ. That was Jesus' mission. We are his body. It should be our mission as well. The purpose then, so we have a mission, but what is the purpose of our church? The purpose of Day Spring Community Church is to live out Christ's command to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach these new disciples to obey all the commands that Christ has given us. You say, well, that sounds familiar. Well, it should, because in Matthew 28, 18 through 19, or 18 through 20, Jesus told his disciples as he was leaving, all right, so this is his commission to them. 
I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is called the Great Commission, but really, I like to refer to it as the Great Commission, right? Because we are partnering with Christ to spread the gospel. So it's not just a commission, but it's a commission. Together, corporately, Christ in us, working through us, is winning the lost in the days that we live in. So to accomplish our mission and purpose, we have, we have to have a workable plan for reaching the lost. We, it's, it's great to have novel ideas. I've had a lot of great ideas in my life that never came to fruition because I had no plan on how I was going to execute that. I had no plan on how I was going to reach that. And we can have the loftiest ideas, but if we do not have a way of executing the idea of reaching the lost, if we don't have a way of discipling, then we're never going to accomplish Christ's mission on the earth. And so we developed a strategy, you know, through a lot of prayer about how do we do that? How do we execute this mission? And we came up with four different pillars. Here are the four pillars if you're writing them down. Live, go, dwell, share. That's our four. Four key words that basically tell us how to execute the mission. Live, go, dwell, share. Share. So we're going to start with live, all right? So here's the first one. We want to live devotionally. We want to live devotionally. This is our first pillar. And that means living out the great, not the great commandment, but living out the great, or not the great commission, but living out the great commandment in our neighborhoods, in our communities, workplaces. Short and simple, people need to see Jesus in us, in the way that we live, the way that we talk, the way that we respond. Jesus is the one who modeled devotional living. He started every day on mission. Do you think there was ever a day that Jesus woke up that he wasn't thinking about saving the lost? There was never a day. There was never a day that Jesus woke up and it was the furthest thing from his mind about seeing people saved. He was on mission every single day. As believers, we have got to be on mission every single day. You say, well, I've got kids, and I've got work, and I've got this, and I've got that. Jesus, I'm sure, had a lot of things vying for his time, but he never lost fact of wherever I'm at, I'm on mission. I'm, on, I'm at work, I'm on mission. I'm at school, I'm on mission. I'm at home, I'm on mission. Because I never know who's going to walk up to my door and, and, and knock on the door, and I have this opportunity to share Jesus with them. So he constantly lived on mission. He had a firm understanding of his mission, and that mission was to seek and save a lost. Jesus never took a vacation from his mission. You know, as a pastor, sometimes, you know, I've shared this story before, going on vacation, and while I'm on vacation, like, we'd go to a Wednesday night service, you know, because we're not on vacation from Jesus, right? We're, we're on vacation, but we're not, we're not trying to get away from God on vacation. And so we went to a church when we were down in, uh, I think it was in Alabama, and we showed up on a Wednesday night, and the pastor came out and shook our hand, introduced himself. I told him who I was, and he said, you're a pastor? I said, yeah. He goes, and you're at church on a Wednesday night on vacation? And I said, I said yeah. He goes, you must be one of those saved pastors. And we kind of giggled together, but I thought, that's sad that it surprises him because I'm on, we're always on mission. Even on vacation, we're on mission. That part we never get away from. Part of living devotionally also means that we have to communicate with God every day. Communicate with God every single day. You know, think about Luke 5, 16. It says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. You cannot live the Great Commission without being in constant communication with the architect of your faith. You can't be. We have to be on mission every single day, but we have to talk to the architect every single day to understand what is being built, where to go, and what to do. You know, this, the next thing that Jesus did, and this is the part I think is very interesting, because we have to think about how do we do this next thing, in the context of our daily life, because we're living devotionally. Here's the next thing. He revealed things that he knew about God to those around him through miracles, parables, acts of compassion, and teaching. 
So every day, Jesus was busy revealing things about God to the people around him. Maybe he revealed something about God to them by healing them. Maybe he revealed something about them uh, to them about God through a teaching. Maybe he was revealing God to them through uh, some kind of act of compassion when he fed the 5,000. There was just all these different ways that Jesus communicated who God was to the people around him. And they were, they were always different, right? Jesus didn't necessarily heal every day. Sometimes he, he, he had compassion and, and fed the 5,000. Some days he walked on water. Some days he prayed for a lame man. Other days he, he raised the dead. So there was just all these different ways. Sometimes he just gathered the thousands and he taught them the word of God. And so every day he was finding new ways. How often do we think about new ways that we can engage the people around us and express to them who God is? You know, if you look at Matthew 9, 35 with me, it says, Jesus traveled through all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. So wherever he went, he was just revealing God to people. I love that. Nothing, it, nothing I mean, yeah, some of the things he did were spectacular, but I know that's something I can do every day. I may not heal the sick every day, but I can demonstrate compassion. I can show the kindness of God and the love of God. I can do a lot of things to show people who Jesus is every single day in new and different ways. Another thing that Jesus did every day living devotionally is that he lived in obedience to the word of God. Listen, there is nothing that a world hates more than seeing a person confess to be like Christ and then not live like Christ. Jesus lived in obedience to the word of God every single day. John 8, 28 says this. Jesus said, when you've lifted up the son of man on the cross, then you will understand that I am he. I do nothing on my own, but only say what the father taught me. How many of us can say that? How many of us can say, I only say what the father taught me? No, I, have to, I wish I could put words back in my mouth every day. <laughs> the things that I've said, I'm just like, well, I should put that back in. Jesus would not have said that. Not even in jest would he have said that. Not even in the privacy of just me and my wife would he have said that. You know, because sometimes we say things we probably shouldn't in company we feel comfortable with, right? But Jesus would never have gone there in that situation. He lived in obedience to the word of God. This requires us to spend some time in his word hearing from him. You cannot know what God wants if you spend no time daily in his presence, not only just in communicating in prayer, but listening to his word. You know, a lot of times we hear that. We hear people say, well, I have a hard time, you know, reading the Bible. But it's really, you're doing more than just reading. You're listening to God. That's why I don't have them. People say, well, I listen to the Bible as I'm driving. I don't have a problem with that. Listen to the Bible because you're listening to God. When I'm reading, I'm simply listening to God. And that's what Jesus would do. He would listen for God's instruction, and then he would live it out. Being seen in the community, practicing and living the principles that we confess to hold so closely is what will win people to Christ. But if we do not live those standards out, if we don't live according to the word of God, it doesn't matter how kind we are, how nice we are. People still are not going to put their faith in Christ if we're not a better reflection of it to them. In John 5, 19 Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the son, of, the son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees his father doing. And whatever the father does, the son also does. Wouldn't that be great if that was our, our mindset every day? I'm only going to do what I see the father do. I'm only going to say what I see the father say. I'm only going to do what Jesus did. I'm only going to say what Jesus did. I'm only going to react as Jesus did. That's how I'm going to live my life before the people around me. You know, the essence, really the essence of living devotionally is Matthew twenty two thirty seven 37 through 40. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important, important to love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. I mean, the entire Bible is wrapped up in this verse. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the, I mean, that is our commission in life. God, that's the commandment that God gave us, and that's what we're supposed to live out. 
our daily devotion to Christ is the foundation we lay within our village. I like the idea of having a village. You know, your village is basically the people that God puts around you. It's your neighborhood. It's your workplace. It's your family. That's your village. And you've been called to be a missionary to that village of people. And sometimes our villages cross, right? We have mutual friends and mutual family. But I will guarantee you that I have a scope of people in my life that you don't know. I have a scope of people in my life that my daughter doesn't even know. You know, it's hard to believe, but it's true. I mean, sometimes I'll be talking to people and my son will walk up and say, Dad, who's that? You know, even though he's lived in, he lived in my house for 20-some years and he goes to church here his whole life, there are still people that I know that he doesn't know because my village is different. His village is different. And, and so we need to understand that. We do have crossover, but ultimately you need to know who your village is. Everything else we do, the Great Commission included, is built upon the genuineness and authenticity of our devotional life. You can't do any of the next three things. If you don't have a strong devotional life, you can't. You can try, but you will not come off as being genuine or authentic if you do not have a good devotional life. So here's the second pillar, to go. What does it mean to go? It means to be intentional. We have to be intentional, right? Being intentional about finding the lost where they are and equipping ourselves to reach them there. It's important that you hear what I just said. What does it mean to go? It's being intentional about finding the lost where they are and equipping ourselves to reach them there. Not equipping ourselves to reach them here, not trying to attract them to where we are, but going to where they are and equipping ourselves to meet them where they are. The, the next, that, that pillar is, is strategy is very simple. It, literally, the word go is two letters. But it, it's the hardest thing that we have to do as believers, to actually get outside of our comfort zone and go. This isn't a suggestion by Jesus. He didn't suggest that we go. It's a directive that's intended for every disciple of Jesus Christ. To go means that we are making our way towards something. If I tell you to go, I want you to go make your way towards something, right? Going is all about being intentional. We are being intentional about the mission and the purpose of God. So there's two things we have to be very intentional about. The first, first we must be intentional about finding the lost where they are. We have to go to where they are, not wait for them to come here. And secondly, we have to be intentional about equipping ourselves to reach them there. So finding the the lost where they are. Isaiah 52, 7 says this. How beautiful are the mountains, on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news. The good news of peace and salvation, the news that God of Israel reigns. And although Jesus preached in synagogues, he did not see those synagogues as the exclusive location that the gospel was to be preached in. Never. There was never a time that Jesus said, I cannot share the gospel with you out here on the mountainside. I can only do it in the temple. I can't teach you here in the marketplace. I can only do it in the synagogue. Jesus understood that the gospel had to go far beyond the synagogues and the temple. It was going to reach the people that it needed to reach. In fact, his instructions to the disciples before he left was to take the gospel to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And the gospel, according to to many of us, think about it. How far does the gospel go out from you? Has it made it outside your home? I mean, has it made it outside your family? Has it made it outside the church doors? Has it made it into into where you work? Has it made it into your family reunions? Has it made it into your schools? How far has the gospel gotten out from you? It's the gospel that has to go. You're the vessel to carry the gospel, but the gospel has to go. In fact, that's the first two letters of the word gospel. Come on, somebody. That was Holy Spirit inspiration or just good English. One of the two. I don't know. Think about this for just a moment, too. Jesus didn't simply say it. He modeled it, right? He would teach by lakesides, sitting at wells, walking down the road. He didn't wait 
for the lost to find him, he went out and found the lost. He took the good news to them. Look at this passage, Matthew 18 and verse 12. It says, if a man has a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, what will he do? Won't he leave the 99 others on the hills and go? He'll go out to search for the one who is lost. Won't he leave the 99 and go? Look at this passage, Luke 14, 21 through 23. The servant returned and told his master what they had said. His master was furious and said, Go quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. After the servant had done this, he reported, There is still room for more. So his master said, What? Go. Go out into the country lanes and behind the hedges and urge anyone you find so that the house will be full. Again and again, Jesus didn't just say it, he modeled it. He constantly went into places. Jesus went into areas that nobody else would want to go into. His disciples didn't certainly want to go into Samaria. But Jesus said, I must go through there. They oftentimes didn't want to go. You know, they talked about Galilee, and they talked about Bethlehem, and they talked about Nazareth. And even Nathaniel said, is there anything good that can come out of Nazareth? Jesus went to all the places that nobody else wanted to go, and he took the light to them. He took the gospel to them. And that's what God's called of us. I think what I love about the passage is it helps to answer the question, who are the lost people that I'm called to? Do you ever think of that question? Who are the lost people that I'm called to? Jesus said, go to the streets, the alleys, the highways, and the country lanes where you live. Where you live. Not everyone is going to be called to a foreign country. <laughs> Praise the Lord, right? Most of us are called, to be, are called to the people that we encounter every day. That's who we're called to. We're called to the people that we encounter every single day. Your mission field is your neighborhood. Your mission field is your workplace, your family, your school. Perhaps it's a people group that you can identify with because you lived that life and God brought you out. So you can identify with those people, what they've been through. You know, it's, it's amazing that somebody that's been delivered from alcohol, how great a witness they can be and a tool to help others come out of alcoholism because they've been there. I've never struggled with that. I've got some great word and I've got some great advice that I can give them, but I don't know the ins and outs of what they walk through to climb out of that addiction and that there are people who have that can be a very big blessing to others to show them how they climbed out of that. That may be the group God calls us to. It's the people that God puts in front of you on a daily basis. That's your mission. Your mission field is the people that God puts in front of you on a daily basis. And that changes. That changes every single day. I don't meet the same people. I had different people today that came into the church or I met as I went out of the church. Different people every single day. But that was my mission field for that day. Don't think your mission field is the same people every single day. It may not be. It may be if you're a stay-at-home mom, you might have the same three or four kids that you're looking at every single day, and that, those people don't change. But I say keep your eyes open because you don't know who's going to show up at your door. You don't know who you're going to see at the gas station. You don't know who you're going to see at the grocery store. You don't know who you're going to run into that day that simply stops in and says, can you pray for me? Your mission field changes every day. Sometimes we think to live missions means that we have to go to a country with an unreached people group that has never heard the name of Jesus. We think that's what it means to live missions. But how many know that just because people may have already heard the name of Jesus doesn't mean that he isn't the last thing on their mind? They've heard the name of Jesus, they've heard of Jesus, but Jesus on a daily basis is the furthest thing from their mind whatsoever. They've got so many other things that are a priority over Christ. He may not even cross their mind on, 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 in, in weeks, months, years, right? I mean, the circles that they run in and the people that they do things with and, and where they live, they may never even think about Jesus for months and months and months on end. It doesn't even cross their mind. Our job in those mission fields, we are called to bring the reality of Christ to the forefront of their mind. I mean, you may just be talking to someone someday, and you're just talking to them about, you know, they're telling about a sickness that they had, and you begin to talk about how Jesus 
met you when you were sick one time and healed your body. All of a sudden, what have you done? You've brought Jesus to the forefront of their mind. They weren't thinking about Jesus before they walked up to you. But all of a sudden, because you began to share your faith and to share your story, you you brought Jesus to the forefront of their mind. That's being a missionary. It's putting Jesus in front of them by simply talking to them on a daily basis. It's living out the reality of Christ in front of them, making Jesus a focal point and not an afterthought. That's being a missionary. That's the going that we're talking about. This is where the fear comes in. (laughs) We're laughing. Yeah, this is where we often shy away because we are fearful about what to say. That's why we must be intentional about equipping ourselves to reach the lost where they are. You know, whenever you think about it for just a minute, you know, if you started a new job and you showed up on day one and you were supposed to have a hammer and a screwdriver when you started, you get there on day one, you have neither one of those things, and day one is hard. And it may not have been your fault because nobody told you to bring a hammer and a screwdriver. But day two, if you don't show up with a hammer and a screwdriver, if you don't go home and equip yourself, day two is going to be hard because you're ignorant. You knew that I'm not equipped. I, I am not equipped for day two if I don't bring the hammer and the screwdriver with me. God's called us to be missionaries. He's called us to go. And we've got to equip ourselves to take the gospel, I don't know what to say, then study what to say. Get into the word of God and find out what the gospel is, that it's reconciliation is where forgiveness and repentance meet. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself is the great commandment that God has given us. Learn the word so you're equipped when you step into that situation. You're not fearful. If I'm going in day two with my hammer and my screwdriver, I'm not afraid right? that I'm ill-equipped. I may not know what's ahead of me. I may not know exactly what to expect day two. But I'm going to go into it with a lot more confidence because I showed up equipped today, more equipped than I was the day before. Some of us are no more equipped 20 years after coming to Christ than when we came to Christ. We're still as fearful today as we were back then. In fact, we're actually more fearful than we were back then. The beauty of when you first come to Christ is your ignorance. It really is. Because all you have is a testimony, and your testimony is what God has done in your life, and you cannot wait. He's pulled you out of the miry clay. you got to tell somebody about what God does for you. But as time goes on, you get away from that. And, and that's why often you, hear, you read in Scripture, David pray, restore the joy to me of my salvation to me. Because he even knew that. I've gotten away, so far away. If I can get back to the joy of my salvation, I can be effective again. We have to disciple others. That's where fear, this fear comes in. That is why we must be intentional about equipping ourselves. We must remain actively engaged in being disciples ourselves. The minute you think that you know it all, you become ineffective as a disciple. We're constantly learning and constantly growing so that we can turn, so that we can in turn disciple others. We have not truly become a disciple until we've discipled someone else. We're not even really a disciple. We're students. We're really just students of the word until we actually disciple someone else. Then we're disciples. So we have a lot of students of the word sitting in churches, and they're very knowledgeable, but they never made a disciple. They've never discipled anyone to, to follow Christ. We, have to, we, we must be students of the word for our own sake, but also to accomplish the mission. We have to stop coming to church thinking about what we're going to get and start thinking about what we're going to receive that we can share with others. Something from this message tonight, if you don't take anything from this message tonight and share it with somebody else, then basically you've just stocked your refrigerator and you're not sharing. (laughs) It's all all the purpose of the word tonight is to equip you to take it to other people and to share it with other people, to take that gospel to them. We have to stop coming to church thinking about that, that it's just about me and I've got to get, I'm, I'm coming in hurting, I'm coming in uh, you know, broken and I need healing. That's great, but remember the purpose of your healing is so that you can go 
and make disciples. It's not to be whole. If the purpose of you coming is to be whole, then we've missed it. The entire success of the Great Commission rests on how we respond to that one directive, go. Here's the third pillar. Dwell. To dwell means to live relationally with the people around us. Living relationally requires that we engage the community of people that God has called us to reach. That means we've got to learn their language, their practices, their customs, their family dynamics that are specific to their mission field or our mission field by spending time building relationships with those people. I've shared this before that that those people who work at Toyota have a complete different language than I know. I mean, I, I shared like words like Kaizen, and, and even their shifts, they have colors, and they know what the colors of the shifts mean. And, and, and so they, it, within Toyota, there is a whole language within that company. They know words, and they say things, and I stand on the outside looking in thinking, I have no idea what these people are talking about, but they all seem to, to know. And you can mention a shift, or you can mention a, a department, or you can mention an east wing or a west wing, uh, you know, here or there. And, the, and they'll all shake their heads because they're well aware that, listen, that is a mission field in and of itself. And the best people to reach those people is somebody that understands the dynamics. Right? This is what it's all about, living relationally. Love your neighbor. You know, I appreciate Mark 12, 29 through 20, 31. It's Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, he could have said love others as yourself. But for me, I, th I think that the idea that he said neighbor was important. Neighbor refers to or relates to proximity. My neighbor. I, I think about somebody's my neighbor. You know, Pooch, we live in the same town, and me, and, me and Pooch do, but we're not neighbors. We just live in the same town, right? The, so, but I've got, you know, Tylee and Terry, they're my neighbors, because I could throw a rock and hit their house. They wouldn't like it very much, but I could do it. I'd have to throw pretty hard. I don't know. I, don't, I might need a closer neighbor. The Davises are my neighbor. They moved out. And I didn't even throw your rocks at them, but they moved. But you see what I mean? When you talk about neighbor, you're talking of, there's something about proximity. The people that God puts in, in place around you. The word neighbor sheds a little more light on the nature of the relationship with, with, that we have with those that God has called us to reach. A neighbor is not just a random person that I come in contact with. That's not a neighbor. It is a person that I live in relation to. That's a neighbor. The people that God puts in my path every day are my neighbors. The people I live next door to are my neighbors. The people in my house are my neighbors because relationally I live close to them. Perhaps it's someone I live next door to, I work regular with, a schoolmate, someone I see daily, a member in our community that I see on a regular basis. My neighbors are always people that I walk through life with. So when, I say, when we say to go dwell, what God means is we're not supposed to stay at a distance, but we're actually supposed to draw near to them to get to know them, to get to understand their family dynamics and get to understand. You know, we had an individual in the church that for years and years, I really didn't know a lot about them, even though I spent a lot of time with them. And then one afternoon, I sat down and talked with them, and I heard their life story, and I was absolutely shocked at his life and what had happened in his life. I was, became much closer to that person in my own heart than I'd ever had before. And I'd been around him for years and years and years. I was learning something. We have an ordination candidate that I, I read her. She gave her testimony, and I've known her for years. And I read through her testimony that she was taken up to the district office. And I, was at, I wrote her, I texted her after I read it. And I said, I had no idea about your life, life none of this stuff about you. That began to stir in my heart about dwelling, that if there's a weakness in my life, if I was talking about these four pillars, probably the weakest area in my life is learning to dwell with people 
in a way where I get to know them relationally. And I know their language. I understand their, their, their family dynamics. All of those things is something God would have me to do. Living relationally requires that we engage the community of people that God called us to reach. You know, as I mentioned earlier, that may, may mean learning the language, practices, and customs and family dynamics to their mission field. You know, too often when it comes to reaching the lost, we engage our m- neighbors much like we do a missions trip. I want you to hear me, okay? We show up unexpected, we inundate them with Jesus, we demonstrate compassion through acts of kindness, and then we go home. <laughs> and then we go home. That's kind of how we do it. You know, we're like, hey, you know, the pastor will get up and say, hey, we need to reach out to your neighbors. And, and so we show up unexpected and, and we give them all kinds of Jesus and we do something nice for them. And then we go home and we don't talk to them for three more years. So the pastor mentions it again. Missionaries, however, they dwell with them. They dwell with the people that God called them to reach. They invest in learning their language, studying the customs, and showing up in their lives every single day. They show up. Now, they don't don't impose themselves, but they're a presence, right? They're a presence. When I think about my neighborhood, and and even like in social media, I'm friends with the folks in my neighborhood, and I try as often as I can to like and to comment and to connect, specifically with people that I'm neighbors to, I'm close to, because I'm I'm called to be a missionary to them. I'm called to that neighborhood. I'm called to minister the gospel to them. One of our missionary friends, and I will say this, although there's nothing wrong with mission trips, we cannot call ourselves missionaries simply because we spent six days in a country. And this is what one of our missionaries had said. I've quoted this before. This is Rich McCartney. He says, as believers... Our missions assignment is not just a seven to ten day missions trip, but a lifetime of learning cultural differences and doing life together right where our mission field is at. And that's not just for those who are called overseas. That's those of us called right where you live, wherever your house is, wherever you work. This, is the, this principle doesn't change. Jesus himself recognized that living in relation to those he came to save was important. Look at John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus realized that winning the loss was not going to happen unless he spent time among us, experiencing everything that we experienced. That's why he came. How can we expect to win people to Christ that we don't want to spend any time with, that we don't want to have in our home, that we don't want to get to know in some way. This is important as a church that we break through this barrier. Jesus initiated those relationships by finding common interest. Whenever he came up to the disciples who were fishing, isn't it interesting that he connected with them about fishing? He said, I'll make you fishers of men. And he made a connection with them. How about meeting people at the point of their need? How many times did he he come up on a sick person and he had compassion on them and he healed them? Sometimes, you know, when the neighbor gets sick, do you just pray for them and hope they get better? Or do you reach out in any way so that they can see the love of Christ through you? Take them a meal, drop something off on their doorstep, something that would communicate that they are more to you than just someone who lives next door. Or showing up often in familiar places. I think about Zacchaeus. I love the story. You know, it said Zacchaeus ran ahead and he climbed up in the tree because he knew Jesus was going to pass that way. I thought, how interesting is that that story, is that Jesus passed by a place enough times that people began often to know which way he was going and would run ahead in order to meet him there. How about we make a deliberate effort to, to pass by people intentionally to get to know them. Sometimes we have to go out of our way maybe to stop by a person's desk to say hello that morning. I could have went this way and avoided them completely, or I could have went this route. It would have taken me two minutes more, but I would get to say hello to this person that I know their parent is dying of cancer, and I could stop by to encourage them on my way to my desk, right? 
Think about that just for a minute, how we can relationally be better neighbors to the people around us. Jesus didn't just host a Bible study at church. His relationship with his disciples probably best emulates how to live relationally. And we'll think, we'll think about these bullet points real quick. When we think about relationship dwelling with, think about Jesus and his disciples for just a minute. He spent three, the last three and a half years of his life with those 12 men. I mean, all the time, day and night, he was hanging out with them. He ate many meals with them. It doesn't say he ate every meal with them, but he ate a lot of meals with them. He spent time with them. He built memories with them as they traveled around the region, encountering many different people in different situations. So they have all these memories that they remember as they spent time together. They were building memories with him as he walked on water, healed the lame, raised the dead. They're never going to forget that. They're never going to forget walking with him and having all of these encounters, these miraculous encounters, hearing the teaching, you know, and even the, the, the two disciples that walked with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, uh, Jesus was just talking to them. They didn't know it was Jesus, but they, they commented later, didn't our hearts burn within us when he would talk about the scripture? Wouldn't it be awesome just to walk with people and to tell them about God and to share our testimonies and maybe miraculous things will happen in their life. They'll never forget it. They'll never forget that time. We had a young man years ago that, that came. We had, used to do an open gym night when I first came to the church. This is a long time ago. Friday night gym nights. And we would go down and play basketball. And we'd have a little halftime. And I'd do a little gospel presentation. And then we'd play ball after that. And we started off at 10 or 12. And it got pretty big, man. It was about 30 guys that would come out. And it went for a long time. And I don't remember what happened, why we had to stop. But about 10 years after that, a young man walked into the church. He wasn't a young man anymore. He was married, and, and he walked in with his wife. He said, do you remember me? And I said, I'm real sorry. I said, but I don't remember you. And he told me who he was, and I said, oh, yeah, I do. I remember you. And uh, we played basketball. He goes, you were pretty good. And I said, no, I wasn't. I said, your memory's not that good. I said, I was not that good at basketball. I said, but I, I was younger, and I didn't, like, hurt myself too bad when I played. But he told me, he goes, he goes man, I, it, this is 10 years later. He goes, I wish you still did that. He goes, I really love coming to those. He goes, I learned a lot. I met a lot of people, but I felt loved when I was there. Wow. I, this is walking with him. That's all, I mean, that, that's literally all dwelling with people, just spending some time. I have no idea the impact that was having on his life until he told me. And only because I just walked with him during that time. He practiced the same principles, not just with his disciples, but, you know, he did the same kind of stuff Jesus did with other questionable characters. Look at Matthew 9, 10 through 11 with me. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus was no respecter of person. He sit with anybody to share the gospel with them, whether they were righteous or whether they were sinners. He didn't care. He came to demonstrate the love of God to them. The idea of dwelling with people for greater kingdom impact is really kind of cross-cultural. You know, I messaged several of our missionaries around the world, and I asked them how important it is for them to dwell among the people that they're trying to reach. And as I listened to their response, I heard two reoccurring themes in their statements. Here's what they said. Dwelling communicates authenticity while building trust. It communicates authenticity authenticity while building trust. They're not like a mission team that's blowing in and blowing out. They're there. They're going to be here the next day, and they're going to be here the day after that. And when everybody else is closed in because of the pandemic, they're closed in with them. When they, they shop at the same rest, the same at the shop, they shop at the same little grocery stores. They shop in the same markets. They eat the same food. They drink the same water. I mean, they, they live. They dwell among them, and so it creates authenticity. But it also builds trust with the people who are living there. They begin to trust them. 
People come to realize that you are generally interested in them when you have taken the time to appreciate their language, are interested in their culture and understand their family dynamics. You know, and there's a lot of different languages, and I'm not talking about I'm not talking simply about Spanish or French or, or Chinese, but there's the language of, of farming. There's the language of manufacturing. There's the language of nursing. Sit around some nurses talking to each other. I don't understand anything that they're saying, but they do. They, but there's a, there's a language there. So if you're trying to reach those people, how much do they appreciate when you know what they're talking about, but you're not actually from there? It's a powerful thing that takes place. That type of authenticity earns trust. Author Randy Helm wrote in the Enrichment Journal that trust in a relationship gives you the credibility to influence. And only then is the door open to share Christ. You've got to build credibility. Credibility comes from building trust. Trust is built from authenticity dwelling in those relationships, but sometimes I wonder if our emphasis on relationships might cause us to turn all of our focus on relationship building and indefinitely postpone the gospel proclamation. We got to build relationships. We got to build relationships, and that's all we do, and we never tell anybody about Jesus. If the goal is to make friends but not disciples, then we're falling short of the Great Commission. We don't want to just make a bunch of friends. We we want to make disciples. That's what God's called us to do. The key is to build relationships and share the gospel within the context of those relationships. That's what it means to live on mission. Every relationship that we build, there has to be a desire to share Jesus with them. You say, well, doesn't that sound like there's an ulterior motive? There is heaven. I have an ulterior motive for all of my friends that they make heaven. How, big of, how much of a friend really am I if I don't ever tell them about Jesus? If I never communicate the gospel to them in any form, if I have never built enough, if I have had a friend for 20 years that I have not built enough relational context with them to share the gospel with them without them getting mad and walking away, I have not learned how to dwell with people. But once I figure that out, once I know how to spend time with them, that door will open. And you can have those conversations. doesn't mean that they'll be one to Christ, but you can have those conversations. One of our missionaries, Brett Vandermolen, said this, If we're going to win our neighbors to Christ, they're going to have to see us as part of who they are. Not simply people occupying space next to them, but people invested in their lives. That's what it means to dwell. Do the people that live near you Are you valuable to them? Are you valuable to them as a neighbor? Are you valuable to them as a friend? Do they even know who you are? Does the person in the next cubicle even know who you are? Does the person in the the next vehicle know who you are? Do you see what I mean? Is that how are we supposed to build those relationships if we don't dwell with people? The last pillar, it's a shorter one, and we're just about done for the night. The fourth pillar is to share. It's to be conversational. That I know everybody loves that St. Francis of Assisi post, you know, uh, talking about, uh, you know, that we ought to uh, preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. I hate that. I, 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 you may love that quote, but it's, it's silly to think that we are going to win people to Christ without opening our mouths. It's not possible. We have to preach the gospel. Jesus came. If that was the case, Jesus lived a sinless life. He would have never had to teach. He would have never had to. He could have just lived sinless and been different from everybody else on the planet. But he still opened his mouth and he preached the word and he preached the gospel. We have to share the gospel. We must then, when it comes to being conversational, we must then tell his story revealing Jesus to them through various means. And we can do it through teaching, prayer, working of miracles, acts of compassion, our personal testimony, witnessing, one-on-one discipleship. But Romans 10, 14 declares, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? We all have a testimony. 
Every single one of us has a testimony. We are an expert in what God has done for us. I'm an expert. I may not be an expert in what God's done for you, but I am an absolute expert on what God has done for me personally. Nevertheless, your story has to include his story. It's not a testimony if his story isn't tied to your story. You might, have a, you might have an interesting story to tell, but it's not sharing the gospel if it doesn't tie to his story. We must tell his story by revealing Jesus to others through various means. So, we, you know, this is, a, this is a means. I'm teaching tonight about Jesus. This is a means of declaring the gospel. When I stop and I pray with somebody who is sick and I declare Jesus' healing over them, I'm declaring the gospel to them. When I, we, we lay hands on the sick and they recover, we're declaring the gospel to them. When we feed the 5,000, we're declaring the gospel to them. When we share our personal testimony, when we witness, when we take our kids aside and we begin to disciple them in the word of God, we open our mouths and we share. We have to open our mouths. We have to talk about Jesus to people. Now, perhaps that is the hang-up for some. If I could just live like Jesus and never have to open my mouth, then I would be much more open to this winning souls for Christ thing. Unfortunately, Romans 10, 14 tells us that we have to open our mouth. We have to declare his word. We have to talk to other people about Jesus. We have to, listen, we have to get on the cross. Because what we're trying to do is to get off the cross. It's too painful to share. We're trying to get off the cross. And Jesus said we need to take up our cross. He knew it was going to be hard. Telling other people about Jesus is hard. People rejected Christ, so they're going to reject you. There are going to be people that do not like what you have to say about Jesus. They're not going to like you simply because of your position on Christ. That's it. They don't need to hear anymore. They just know you love Jesus, so they hate you. There's nothing you can do about it except share the gospel with them. Demonstrate the love of God to them. It's not your job to win people over. The Holy Spirit will do the wooing. Your job is to be obedient, to share the gospel with them. So this is the strategy you know, to live devotionally every day. So do people do look at your life. So ultimately, when you go to share the gospel with them, your character backs up what's coming out of your mouth. That's living devotionally. Then you have to actually go. You have to be intentional about impacting people. Think about who you need to reach for Christ. Keep your eyes open every day. You know, as you walk into your mission field, somebody around you every single day probably needs a touch from God. In some way, if we'll just keep our eyes open to it. And then make the the deliberate, intentional decision to dwell with the people closest to you. Who do you need to sit down with for coffee? Who do you need to have over to play some games? Who do you need to relate with that is not people that you already relate with, but somebody that might need Christ? And then as you build that relational context to open your mouth and tell them about Jesus. And maybe you'll win a soul. Maybe you'll just plant a seed. Maybe you're going to, we don't know what's going to happen. All you're doing, you're going to walk away from that situation knowing I did what God told me to. Right? Amen. Let's stand together as we close. Thank you, Father. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you that we have, we have a mission to seek and save the lost. I thank you that we have a purpose as a church to make disciples of all nations. But Lord, I also am thankful that we have a strategy that we can employ every single day of our lives to live, go, dwell, and share. I pray that you would, you would stir our hearts, stir everyone in the house tonight, stir all, everyone watching at home and those who may watch later. This is the strategy. These are our pillars. This is what's going to see kingdom impact happen in our communities and our villages as we take the gospel out and begin to share it. Father, I ask your blessing today. Father, over this congregation, as you release this field of missionaries into their mission fields, in Jesus' name, everyone says, amen. Hey, just one quick announcement for all the men. Do not forget, 8 o'clock this Saturday morning is our men's breakfast, 8 o'clock Saturday morning. So it'll be at the FLC. We invite you to come.